Good morning, everybody, if you're in the UK, that is. Um, welcome to this online roundtable. Welcome back after your summer break. I hope you're well, well rested. Uh, the Russia and Eurasia program is certainly back, uh, and we'll be trying to cope with the immediate and the long-term trends as think tanks ought to do, I suppose. Uh, when I say immediate, one or two things come to mind. Uh, perhaps right now, uh, it's the attempted murder of Alexei Navalny. Um, and in some ways, Arkady Stolsky and I were just debating this. To me, it, it doesn't change much. It, it, makes, it does make the, the title of today, the reconfiguration of a regime, in some ways look a little odd, um, because I don't believe that the nature of a regime is changing particularly. Um, and so one has to ask, what's, what's, you know, in what, 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 what does change really mean? But the real experts, i.e. not me, uh, we do have three of them speaking today, would certainly tell you that I suppose the regime is like the proverbial paddling duck, that there's a lot going on under the water. And so that's what we're trying to get across to you today, what's going on under the surface. Yekaterina, I'm sure, will be more um, nitty gritty and detailed as she is talking about, as I said before, uh, the legislative process and the, GM, the forthcoming general elections. Over to you, Yekaterina. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity of addressing uh, this uh, very educated uh, audience and audience interested in all things uh, Russian. I would uh, agree with the previous speaker in saying that uh, while we should be cheery of uh, expressions like historic moment or the most dangerous moment for the last 30 years, one can't help feeling that we do experience uh, the final uh, moments, and these may be historically long moments, of a certain years long cycle. Uh, there are transformations going on and while I'll be speaking about uh, new legislation and new rules laid out for uh, the future period, uh, again one can't help uh, doubting whether any sort of set of rules, whether any legislative frame adopted at this moment will hold out for any uh, historically significant period. Uh, we should, I think, follow these changes uh, their worth uh, at least knowing about, but we should also keep in mind the possibility of it's not being the new norm uh, and uh, not being the new uh, stability which is going to stay with us for again the next uh, 30 years. We are in a transformative moment. We are not quite aware of what we are transforming into. Uh, one of the reasons, the most evident reasons of this transformation is that uh, personalistic autocracies to which type both Russian and the Belarus political regimes belong uh, to a very great extent depend on the loyalty or at least, at least the past loyalty uh, of the electorate. So uh, personal popularity of a leader is an important element uh, in the workings of political machine. And when these leaders start to experience the erosion of their personal popularity, what is uh, usually called uh, the downward trend in approval ratings, in the ratings of trust, it does necessitate uh, changes in the, both in the uh, legal legislative composition of the regime and in its political practices. Uh, if we keep this uh, important point in mind, then a lot of things become simply to understand. In Russia, uh, since uh, the seemingly triumphant elections, presidential elections of 2018, we have been seeing this downward trend, sometimes faster, like in the summer of 2018, after the pension aid reform, sometimes slower, but never a U-turn, never a change in the trajectory. And this brought the necessity of uh, the major rewriting of electoral legislation. Uh, as you may remember, the constitutional voting of July the 1st was conducted under the, according to the ad hoc uh, law written specifically for this one uh, unique electoral event. But uh, already in May of this year, during the uh, pandemic, during the lockdown, when not so much uh, public attention and not, not so much media attention was directed towards the working of the State Duma, uh, the State Duma, uh, under the, by the initiative of uh, uh, United Russia. Now, fraction members adopted uh, what amounts to a major rehaul of Russian electoral legislation. Now it much closer resembles that of Belarus, allowing uh, preliminary uh, voting uh, during a uh, uh, 
from seven to three days uh, before the actual elections days, much more liberal rules for voting outside of voting booths, uh, at home voting, uh, long distance voting, electoral voting, etc. And at the same time, greatly restricting the access of independent candidates uh, to uh, elections of any level. Among other things, uh, we now have a much longer list of criminal code uh, and administrative code articles that prohibit a person who had once been, been uh, prosecuted uh, from uh, running for any electoral post. What does it mean? It means that uh, with the uh, declining uh, popularity, first of the United Russia Party, uh, and then also of the uh, president, it becomes impossible to deliver the necessary election result by any other means but non-admission. The non-admission of any potentially dangerous candidate or party uh, becomes the only instrument, the only way to ensure that the incumbent wins if he or she is a uh, regional, uh, head of regional administration, or the necessary candidates w candidate wins uh, on uh, elections to legislative assemblies now, and the state uh, and the state Duma. So the State Duma is a key element in any power transfer scenario, whatever form this scenario takes, whether it's from the incumbent to himself, whether it's from him to a successor, or whether it's from him to a collective body. Uh, all the three scenarios are possibilities. And in all three, it is absolutely necessary to uh, be sure of a loyal, loyalistic parliament. So the elections of 2021 will be our next key political event. We are going to have uh, elections, uh, regional elections, quite a large number of it. Uh, on uh, September 13th, the uh, unified uh, voting day. Uh, but this is a, a relatively smaller matter, though it's also important there are quite, quite a few uh, key uh, regions which are um, electing both the governors and uh, the regional assemblies or the uh, city dumas like in Novosibirsk. But uh, this should be perceived as a preparatory campaign uh, before the parliamentary campaign of 2021. And this is the first real voting, uh, not constitutional voting, but real elections that will be held according to this new set of rules, which the association of independent electoral observers Wallace named the worst in 25 years. Uh, this set of rules certainly uh, looks uh, pretty ugly, but uh, again, here we should uh, remember what is the necessity uh, behind this. Uh, the State Duma had uh, adopted during the long spring session of 2020, uh, it has adopted and discussed the constitutional amendment themselves, but here the role of parliament was relatively minor. But uh, it also discussed and adopted a number of other legislative changes uh, into the details of which uh, we will not go uh, too deeply, but uh, the electoral reform I have mentioned, and during the uh, oncoming uh, autumn fall session, the main task of the Duma will be uh, the implementation of constitutional changes into Russian federal legislation. And here I would like to point three uh, directions, three uh, legislative uh, three potential bills that I think are important. Uh, the first is the uh, future law on the state council. As described in the new constitution, it's an absolute cat in the bag. It is just mentioned, but uh, not delineated. We do not know uh, what its composition will be, and most importantly, we do not know what its powers will be. It may remain the decorative institution that it is, that it currently is, or it may become a kind of new politburo, a collective body that uh, will be planned to restrict the future president, the successor of the incumbent. So this... Uh, the, the possibilities are endless, and I do not think, given my, uh, well, given my experience with watching the legislative process in Russia, I do not think that anyone yet has a clear idea. I would suspect that there are a number of uh, projects uh, now circulating uh, in the presidential administration, and some will be uh, chosen according to the then existing political situation. And also, I do think that here, as in the case with many uh, bills and with a constitutional bill, itself, the key elements may be introduced during the second reading in order to have them passed faster and in order to, again, to circumvent uh, media attention. This is uh, 
priority, uh, priority number one. Uh, second, uh, the so-called system of public power, Sistema Publicznej Vlasti, into which the municipal level needs to be implemented. This is implemented. This is a new term. It, is not ex it, it, ha it has not uh, existed in the Russian legal language before, Publicznej Sistema Vlasti. So again, we do not know what that is. It's natural to suppose that uh, the municipalities uh, will become part of vertical of power. But here also other options are not impossible. Like, for example, the idea to uh, lessen the pressure within the system by introducing some degree of political competition on the lowest level, uh, for example, uh, to allow the cities to elect uh, their own mayors. This is a much discussed reform. Not that I believe it to be extremely probable, but it is not impossible as a kind of counterweight to uh, the governors. The introduction of a more uh, electable uh, mayors is, again, is a possibility. And uh, direction number three is the so-called federal territories, which are, again, mentioned in the new constitution, but not described. This may refer to the plans of, uh, for example, uh, uniting Moscow with Moscow region and eliminating Moscow mayoral elections. Again, I'm just naming uh, the, the possible scenarios, not that I think them to be very probable or imminent. But I would very much like to see what these federal territories are and how they will be described uh, in the new uh, legislation. I'm naming these uh, priorities because much more attention will be directed now at the uh, new legislation connected to uh, the so-called traditional values. Changes in the family code, like the one already introduced by Yelena Mizulina. By the way, it's not the only one. There's an alternative uh, bill introduced by Krasininikov and Klishas. Again, I'm sorry to be too detailed, but that's just my cup of tea, so I do think it's so terribly important. Other people may not have the same opinion. So my point is, uh, while there will be a lot of noise, I wouldn't like to call it noise, okay, people do care about these things, but there will be a lot of attention directed towards ideological or uh, religious looking or traditionally minded changes behind all this. And at the same time, there will be going on uh, discussions uh, and changes and implementation of bills that are of much more uh, influence on the general composition of Russia as a federation, so far as it is a federation, now, and uh, on its system of checks and balances, so far as it has a system of checks and balances. Uh, a few words on uh, the future Duma elections uh, themselves. Uh, Arkady has described the new constitution as uh, being much closer to the dictatorship. Uh, to super presidential uh, model, but at the same time, paradoxically, it also raises the price of a state Duma mandate. It does give certain new, if not new powers, at least new additional visibility to the federal parliament that will now have a role in at least discussing uh, the uh, figure of the prime minister and of the ministers, other members uh, of the government. Uh, these people who will be elected deputies in 2021, by the way, at whichever date uh, the elections will take place, because they, uh, the, the scheduled uh, date is uh, in autumn, but there's a possibility it's been allowed by the constitutional court. Uh, there's a possibility of holding elections a little bit earlier. Uh, so they may happen in spring or uh, early summer uh, of 2021, uh, but that, that, is not, uh, that is not terribly important. So these people who will be elected uh, deputies will be present at the moment, the crucial, the dangerous moment of power transfer, presidential power transfer. Again, whenever it takes place, whether in 2024 or, or earlier, before that. Uh, the scenario where uh, constitutional reform happens, then parliamentary elections, and then uh, presidential elections is uh, evidently the one that uh, Moscow tries to uh, sell to uh, Minsk. And from this, we may judge that this is our own Russian scenario. So preterm uh, presidential elections are, uh, again, are not uh, impossible. So how will these uh, elections play out? Uh, 
again, not going too deeply uh, into details, legislative or political, I would like to make one, one final point. Uh, remember the uh, Moscow City Duma elections of 2019. Uh, remember this sequence of events. First, there's elections which no one used to care about, and then suddenly, with the new uh, political atmosphere, people start caring about it, and they want, uh, a lot of candidates want to run. These candidates are barred from participating. There follow uh, protests on the part of potential voters. The candidates are not registered anyway. Uh, then elections happen, protest voting happen, smart voting, uh, and uh, a lot of non-united Russia uh, uh, City Duma members are elected. And the face of the city parliament changes. Uh, another possible uh, sequence of events is uh, protest voting, falsifications to nullify, or at least to smooth the effects of protest voting, and then protests against the falsifications, or rather against the results which are published as official, but are not accepted by the society as such. Again, let me agree with uh, Arkady. Uh, regimes like ours, and like the one in Belarus, they do rest on public consent. At least the uh, people in general, the citizens in general, need to agree that even if there were some unfair play, but the bulk, uh, the, the general uh, result is the, as it should be. It was li like with the constitutional voting. Uh, a lot of people noted that the voting procedure was ridiculous. A lot of people noted that the results were in Moscow and Petersburg were probably not the ones published. But there was this general idea that actually, yes, Russia voted for the amendments. There was the majority, maybe not uh, 60, 62, uh, 72 percent, maybe, uh, maybe 60 percent, but still there was a majority. This is the uh, stable, relatively stable situation. But... There happens a moment in the life of uh, personalistic autocracies when this stability fails. And then, like in Belarus, people do not say, maybe it's not 80%, but maybe it's 60 but they say, no, it's 3%, which, again, may not be true, but we're not talking about realities, we're talking about perceptions. And perceptions in a political process are all important. Thank you. It's a little more unfocused than it might normally be, but that's because of... Uh... Because of okay, the, that's the because of the situation as well as they are. Yes, uh, we are in. Uh, so we are answering questions immediately as they arise, right? Please. Good, good. Uh, thank you for, for the please. question. Uh, I absolutely deny the uh, rumors of my being the most popular uh, political analyst in Belarus. I have no confirmation for this whatsoever, but uh, I did mention the protesters' ability to persist in their protest activity, and if not to increase it, at least not to lessen their visible numbers as one of the factors uh, of the protest effectivity. Uh, there were five factors in all. One is uh, the one I named, uh, the second is is the ability to create parallel power structures, starting with uh, independent counting of votes and ending with uh, people's governors and people's mayors. Uh, the third uh, was the uh, defection, as you said, of the elites, or at least the appearance of elite figures expressing sympathy uh, for the uh, protest movement or resigning uh, in, in favor of uh, their support, of the, because of their support uh, of the protesters. Uh, and uh, number uh, four was the uh, position of uh, international community, now, how the uh, capitals of the big, big powers uh, react and what measures they take, whether they uh, recognize the election results and whether they uh, support uh, the alternative uh, president, the alternative uh, power vertical, which is being, or power horizontal, which is being created. Uh, we see in Belarus partly uh, the presence of all those factors. And by the way, there was one more factor, the uh, diversification of the instruments of protest, because you cannot just keep going out on the streets. It's a nice thing to do. It must be done. But there are other instruments must appear, like strikes, for example, or or uh, those creative uh, types of expressing their protests that uh, the Belarusians are uh, so good at. So we see, to an extent, all those five factors present in the Belarus protest movement. But uh, we see the persistence, we see the numbers, we see uh, diversifications of the instruments, but we have not seen the all-national strike. There were some 
episodes, but it has not developed into an all-country uh, campaign, into a full stop of uh, the country's industrial activity. Now, we see uh, some uh, parallel power structure, at least in the uh, form of Koordinatsyonny uh, Soviet Coordination uh, Council, but we have not seen yet people's mayors or people's governors appear in any territories of Belarus. Something like that started to appear in Grodna, if I'm right, but uh, was uh, stopped uh, by the intervention of uh, Minsk. And we do see a certain support uh, from on the part of international community. Uh, this is also a factor, although it's not crucial, whatever. The autocrats themselves say internal factors are more important than external ones. What we do not see is elite defection, at least not to the extent that touches the all-important uh, Siloviki community. So far, they have to a most extent remain loyal to uh, the president, the acting president, which means that uh, they think that keeping the status quo is more to their advantage than changing it to some new political situation. So long as they think this, so long as no one among them gets the ambition of becoming the next president or the next minister of defense if he changes sides soon enough. Uh, the president of Belarus, uh, given the, well, so that degree of support which has been allotted to him by Russia has a chance to at least to win some time. Mm -hmm. uh, at least to win some time for uh, those necessary consultations and bargaining, which usually constitute the power transfer in more realistic scenarios, rather than the presidential uh, palace being stormed by revolutionary crowds. Usually this power transfer happens uh, much more behind the scenes, that it's not so spectacular and it takes some time. The okay. frame proposed by Russia, one last thing, is evidently again constitutional reform, uh, then parliamentary elections, then presidential elections. Uh, this this is a more or less viable scheme if only uh, the president of Belarus buys it. Understood. How will the role, this is for Yekaterina, I think, how will the role of the systemic opposition evolve as the regime faces an election cycle and grapples with the legitimacy, legitimacy questions? And, and Alex also added to that, you know, what is the future for the United Russia Party and, and even LDPR? Yekaterina, if you may. Uh, about the uh, systemic opposition, uh, yeah. it's interesting to see that, for example, the Communist Party is experiencing some kind of pressure uh, from the presidential administration at the moment. They're seeing the uh, mass uh, decline uh, to register uh, their candidates in many regions uh, where they wanted to run uh, on uh, September 13th. Uh, mm -hmm. Partly it may be a revenge for the way they reacted to constitutional uh, amendments. They were uh, very vocal. Uh, the Communist Party very vocal against the amendment and the uh, Communist uh, Party uh, member of uh, Moscow City uh, Election Commission uh, actually uh, refused to uh, accept uh, the results of constitutional voting and tried to uh, go to court with this case, but didn't succeed. But still, again, they made a lot of negative uh, noises uh, in, the, in the public sphere. This may be one reason, but there are other less symbolic reasons uh, in the uh, situation where there is a great demand for any sort of oppositional looking candidates or just alternative candidates. Uh, any party that has the parliamentary privilege that is that can register uh, candidates and party lists without having to collect signatures attracts this sort of voters energy which uh, sometimes it didn't ask for. Uh, everyone knows that the role of systemic opposition is to stay in the corridor allotted to them not to uh, get too uh, successful and not to fail too badly. So if they win too many mandates, it's as bad as winning none at all. Uh, for example, there's the example of Yablaka party who decides to, who has a very uh, definite decision to stay comatose as, as uh, it's the popular word with our discussion. And recently we had a, a public uh, letter published, an article published by Grigory Yavinsky, which says this in so many words, we mm -hmm. will not, uh, participate in anything that goes, we are going to survive 
for, for some purpose to outlive uh, Putin and then to, to suddenly to come into power or whatever. Uh, this is one tactic. Uh, but if you are a party like LDP or, Ili or uh, the Communist Party, then you need to uh, participate in elections and you experience great pressure from below because uh, a number of uh, young, active, politically active people, especially in the regions, in the municipalities, they want to become candidates and they use these parties just as vehicles. At the same time, the two major uh, parliamentary parties, the Liberal Democratic and the, in the Communist Party, will uh, shortly, uh, in a short time, will have to undergo their own power transfer process for natural reasons. So there's quite a big heritage to fight about, especially in the case of uh, KPRF. In case of the Liberal Democratic Party, it's more of the one-man orchestra. The party may not survive uh, the, the change of leadership. Yeah. But uh, the Communist Party is a real party. It has regional structures, it has volunteers, ideology, recognizable symbols, uh, and real uh, presence in the uh, assemblies, in the regional legislative assemblies, and among the uh, governors. So there's quite a lot going on, and it's worth watching. Again, let me repeat one of my key uh, points. It's dangerous and unwise to dismiss the elements of political system as decorative if the, if the system is not democratic. If we do not have a real, uh, par the real parliament in the sense developed democracies have, it doesn't mean that parliament does nothing or has no role or no importance. That's what Alexei Navalny understood so well, that elections are important and that legislative assemblies, collective bodies uh, are important. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. It's interesting what you say about the Communist Party because people have been telling me to watch the Communist Party for years and how significant and important it is, but I've never quite been able to see how it's not dying, despite what you're saying about its capacities. It's, it's um, not dying anytime soon. Yeah, and I we know. know that the younger generation has leftist sympathies. And mm -hmm. just imagine a new generation of leaders coming after Gennady Zyuganov and revamping the party into something more socialist democratic, okay. and then becoming a real oppositional force. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good comeback again. So my question is, uh, how do we characterize a regime, but since labels are relatively academic, uh, Tony van der Tott also asked, of course, what do we do about it? So the obvious question to finish with is what do we do about it? So I'll start with Yekaterina, um, then Arkady, and fi finish with, uh, with Kolya, sorry. Yekaterina. Ah, very good question. Uh, political science has many uh, names at its disposal. I have uh, already named a few titles for the characterization of this, again, new type of autocracies that have largely emerged uh, after the end of the Cold War, after the... Uh, 90s. Uh, but uh, I do not think that we need to play this game of names. I will name three basic features of the regime. Well, while they stay in place, the regime is the same as it was. When something uh, among the three changes, then we do have real regime transformation. Feature number one, and again, that's, that's, in, that's just my opinion. Uh, feature number one, the mixture of power and money. Power brings money, but not the other way around. Uh, enrichment is possible for those who occupy certain place in the state hierarchy. This is our feature number one. Uh, feature number two, uh, the mixture of political and administrative features. This is the model where uh, the bureaucrats make political decisions and play political roles, while the parliaments, for example, and elected uh, figures and elected bodies are consistently downplayed. This is another feature. And number three, this is a regime that strives as a means of its survival and, and perpetuation for the control of the public sphere. This includes uh, control over uh, political debate uh, and election process via uh, legislative uh, means. Uh, electoral legislation. This includes, of course, the most visible side, uh, control over the media, especially mass media, uh, television, and uh, to an extent where, uh, to an extent where, how, how, where it can, uh, control over the internet, and general uh, care, great care being given to great attention, great resources being spent on the informational side of the regime, the picture, the presentation, the perception. So these are the three, uh, three tools of death, to quote the name of one of Chesterton's uh, stories. Uh, if we see all three present, then we have our competitive autocracy, electoral autocracy, informational dictatorship, whatever. If, again, something changes here, then we have another type uh, of, of a political model. My question is, 
is it even possible to create a perception of public consent to support a personalistic autocracy when the reality is so starkly in contrast to that perception? Well, uh, there are limits to the possibility of creating a false impression, but uh, we've seen these limits in the case of Belarus again, which we're referring to again and, and again. But if you do have the monopoly on state TV, uh, you have quite large capabilities of imposing uh, these false impressions and this completely uh, unrealistic uh, picture of what society is, of what people want, whom they really support, uh, what, what is the mood of the people. People, you can impose it on the people and then of course it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, because it's a uh, it's a norm uh, for a person to uh, try to follow the majority it may not be the most noble co course of behavior but it's the most natural one we are social creatures and we confirm to social norms and if we are told that everyone uh, loves and supports the president except a certain marginalized uh, minority uh, who are on the pay uh, of the West then we being good lawyer by decent citizens want to be the good majority not the bad minority again this uh, course of policy has its limits but I would attract your attention to the concept of informational uh, autocracies uh, as recently developed by uh, Daniel Trisman and uh, Sergei Guriev uh, it's one of the many names of these new types of autocracies we call them uh, hybrid regimes we call them competitive or electoral autocracies or uh, yes personalistic or party autocracies. There are types. Uh, but these are the political models that rely uh, on 80% of propaganda and 20% of force, as the saying is. So, uh, in Russia, I do think that this loyalistic core, which is essential for the preservation of stability as understood by uh, political machines of this type, is still in place. But it is experiencing erosion. This is a very slow process. It's like dissolving of a big lump of sugar in hot tea, and the tea is not so hot, uh, not yet. So it's been going on since... Uh it started, by the way, in 2016, because if you, if you follow the polls, then you'll see two years period of national euphoria, the so-called Crimean consensus, 2014, 2016. Then we had our plateau moment, two years of relative stability. And then uh, starting 2018, we have this unstoppable downward trend. Uh, now it's 2020. Uh, we'll see what happens on September 13th. Uh, and we'll see, uh, we'll see what the developments uh, will be next. Uh, it, it, this process is also connected to the change in um, uh, media habits of uh, Russians. Uh, to put it simply, more and more people are on the internet rather than uh, on TV. And it's not, the point is not that internet is liberal and pro-Western while uh, TV is loyalistic and traditional. The point is that it's a different type of information <coughs> consumption. It educates it's uh, the uh, reader, the viewer in a different way. Uh, watching TV is a passive activity, but watching this same Salaviov program on YouTube is a political action because the very fact of your viewing it uh, changes the number of views. You can put a like or a dislike, you can share it, you can comment. So again, it, it educates a different sort of person who in, term, in, in, in time becomes uh, a different sort of citizen.